Cool. I think well, if quite a few people have trickled in already. And uh, as always, this space is, will also be recorded. So I guess we can begin. Thank you all for joining our spaces today. My name is Sam. I lead growth at Liquidy, and I have Token Brees, who is our DeFi strategist at Liquidy, joining the spaces as well. And today we have some special guests. Uh, certain Way Financial have, jo uh, have joined us today for our spaces. Uh, we have Rhett, who is advisor to Wave and also co-founder of a new protocol in Gravity. And we've got Henry, who is the head of DeFi at Wave. Thank you for joining us today, gents. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks so much for inviting us. For sure. So just to kind of quickly run through the agenda of what we'll cover through today, and then I'll let the, the guys here that are on the call speak. But essentially, we'll cover what is WAVE, uh, how do they make their decisions in terms of uh, managing their funds between DeFi and CeFi, and also touch a little bit more on the liquidity strategies that they use across uh, mainnet and on layer twos for both LUSD and also for, for, for other stable coins as well. So I guess without further ado, what would be great is, Henry, uh, if you could just give... Uh, a little bit of an intro into what Wave Financial is and how they're involved in DeFi. I think that'd be a great start. Definitely. Uh, so Wave Financial is a uh, registered investment advisor uh, in Los Angeles. <clears throat> We've been managing crypto assets since 2018. Um, and we were originally started with this idea of helping, you know, crypto whales who didn't really have much to do with their assets or were keeping it in a ledger in their sock drawer uh, basically giving them a way to put those assets to work because we saw this growing ecosystem, this growing capital market in crypto assets. Uh, and one of the first movers there was Genesis, who, I mean, I'm sure everybody's heard of them now because they're effectively bankrupt. Um, but at the time, they were creating all of these yield opportunities for Bitcoin and Ethereum that didn't really, uh, hadn't really existed previously. Um <clears throat> And so we grew out that practice very slowly. I mean, you, as you can probably imagine, 2018, 2019, uh, early 2020, not a great time to be in crypto, kind of hard to get people to, <laughs> to pick up the phone. Um, but uh, nonetheless, you know, we stuck around, kept grinding it out. And in 2021, our business really took off. Uh, and we ended up that year managing just under $2 billion in assets. Um, now, 2021, of course, coincided with the rise of DeFi as a investable uh, asset class. And I, I specify investable asset class because although it really started to explode in 2020, the risks were pretty great at that time, right? The risks were quite high. It was difficult to, as an asset manager, to justify allocating assets into that space while it was still shaking out. Um, but in 2021, we started to see the rise of all of these incredible uh, investment opportunities in DeFi, a lot of them offering better yields than what we could get with our CeFi counterparties. And so that started to attract more and more of our capital into the space. And then as we got deeper and deeper into the protocols, the thesis, uh, you know, the way that the liquidation mechanisms worked, uh, all of the insurance funds that had been built around it, um, we started to, it, it basically planted the seed for this budding thesis that DeFi actually represented a better risk profile than CeFi. Because unlike, and I can probably get, you know, I can get into more detail on this later on in the call, but um, it, 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 this grew and grew over time until you know, by late 2021 and through most of 2022, virtually all of our assets were deployed into uh, into DeFi across you know multiple protocols on multiple uh, uh, chains. Thanks for that, Henry. And uh, did you mention that in, in DeFi currently you have over 200 million dollars? Uh, is, is that true, or is, is that is, is is that has that number gone up? since 2021 as well? Uh, no, no. All numbers have gone down since, tw <laughs> since 2021. Oh, really? Of course. Of course. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, market crash, so it's it's not necessarily our fault, but, you know, the, the value of assets has declined. So, 
I would say now we have probably between, you know, 50, 70, 75 million uh, deployed into DeFi total. Um, you know, our total assets under management, just as a result of, of like market crashing, are probably closer to like half a billion dollars today. Um, so it's still sizable. Uh, but a lot of our clients took a very risk off uh, approach. And so while we still have a lot of client assets, a lot of them are in strategies that I wouldn't necessarily, you know, directly correlate with DeFi, right? It's just like, we're just staking their assets, you know, like very simple things like that. Um, because again, like our capital base is largely made up of high net worth uh, investors, right? People who have already made a lot of money in crypto. And so for a lot of them, they take the, <laughs> the, uh, the cockroach theory of, of investing in, in crypto, right? Which is that you don't need to be the best or the strongest or the fastest or make the most money in the bull. You just need to survive. Uh, and for anybody who's been through a couple of bear cycles, that, that typically is the way that you make a lot of money in crypto uh, without having to, you know, hope that you're going to get some thousand X on a random token. Um, so for most of these guys, they're very uh, focused on capital preservation uh, and right now they're they're in more of a risk off positioning. But for those who are deployed into risk on positions, uh, most of that is in DeFi. Yeah, I wanted to ask you while you're here because uh, so me, I'm a DJ and I know little about regular finance and, and the needs and wants of, of institutional profiles. But, you know, in DeFi, we are served often with these narratives about institutionals. So, you know, uh, a couple of years ago, it was like, hey, guys, brace yourself. Institutional investors are coming and the space is going to 1,000x because they have so much money. And, you know, two years later, uh, we have the fallout of that. And we realize those institutional investors, uh, well, a lot of them actually were full risk on absolute degenerate and, and you know, went into UST and things like that. And so at the end of the day, they haven't brought that much capital and they, they took pretty risky positions. And that's what surprised me most, you know, is I was expecting those institutionals to behave, um, like we say in French, invest like a good family dad. So, you know, be very responsible, saving products, things like that, but nothing crazy. So any insight on this, like, oh, to, to re-articulate, so it's a big blob. So two questions. First one is, uh, are those institutional actors actually looking for different kind of products than the DeFi DGNs? So here I'm thinking of, you know, insurance, API fixation products and things like that. And two, are they actually uh, risk averse investors? Because the data seems to speak otherwise. Yeah, so that's a great question. Uh, so I would actually attribute some of the poor investment decisions from the institutions to the fact that uh, they were neophytes in the space. Um, and as we all know, crypto has a lot of noise, right? I mean, this is probably one of the noisiest investment spaces in existence. Uh, and so for any sort of an institution that is dipping their toe into the water, which is what a lot of institutions did do in 2021 uh, and to some degree in 2022, um, it's difficult to separate the facts from the noise. Uh, and it's very difficult to build uh, a rigorous risk uh, analysis model on this asset class because you're getting all of that noise. You don't know who you should be talking to, who you should be using as an advisor. Um, I mean, we've all seen it, right? Like you go on LinkedIn or Telegram or whatever, right? There are lots and lots and lots of people who are effectively talking out of their ass uh, and acting like they know what they're talking about. And they really have no idea, you know, how to truly analyze uh, the risks um, uh, that, you know, that they're speaking on. And then that is compounded by the innate tribalism that we find in crypto. So the few voices who did speak out against UST and Luna and that model uh, were typically drowned in a deluge of uh, naysayers, you know, saying that, you know, they're fudding, they're just, uh, you know, they're just talking up their bags, yada, yada, yada. And so for us, uh, and I don't mean wave, I mean us on this call, um, 
for all of us, it's like, you know, we deal with this on a daily basis, right? Like we have developed ways to sort through this noise um, uh, and to figure out like, oh, okay, like that's bullshit. You know, that's FUD. That's not, uh, you know, that, that this guy is, is, uh, is a reliable source. You know, this guy offers good analysis. And for an institution that's just sort of setting foot in here, they don't know who to listen to. They don't know who to talk to. They don't, they don't, they don't understand the models that are being analyzed. Uh, and so I think a lot of them just sort of got sucked into the same FOMO that many first-time retail investors get sucked into when they put uh, money into crypto. Uh, and so a lot of them washed out. And then, of course, you have all of the institutions that backed FTX and a lot of the other C5 plays, BlockFi, Celsius, yada, yada. Um, and I think in that case, I mean, that's just that gets back to the obfuscation and opacity that is inherent in a centralized institution. I mean, FTX, <laughs> when you read what the, uh, the, the new CEO says, right, the guy who's overseeing the bankruptcy, I mean, it's not like FTX built some super sophisticated back office systems to hide their fraud. I mean, they were literally just taking the money and transferring it into their own accounts and then, uh, uh, you know, betting it with Alameda. Um, and yet they were able to sucker in billions of dollars of institutional investors who just did crap due diligence. Um, so I think that's, to, you know, a lot of that is to blame there. A couple of uh, thoughts to just add to this. Um, I think, you know, t to Henry's point, I think that new entrants or people that are, you know, outside observers were more surprised by the Terra Luna meltdown than crypto natives were. So what looks like a degen play, people didn't think at the time were degen plays, um, or some of those institutions that got involved in that did not realize. Um, but it, there's this kind of other piece where I think, you know, certain people have, have said for a while that they think that institutions are going to come and they're going to come via Bitcoin um, and then maybe into other things. And some people think they'll stop there, et cetera. Uh, you know, there's obviously there's some truth there. Like, obviously, um, there's a few institutions that have added a bunch of Bitcoin to their balance sheet. But um, my observation is that the bigger kind of point of entry has been stable coins and especially um, over the last few years in a really low envi low yield environment. It's like, well, this is a place where I can get, you know, better return on my dollars and, you know, to the risk point, it's lower risk because I don't have to bear the, the risk of these volatile assets. Instead, I can just sit on dollars and earn yield. And I think um, those who have entered the space that way and stayed away from Terra Luna, et cetera, have been happy they've done so. Um, but, you know, you have to have some level of, of um, ability to identify things like death spiral risk as well. Yeah. And, and Rhett brings up a great point as well, which is that, uh, you know, you, you really only hear about the guys who invested in UST and who invested in FTX um, because that, of course, is what people want to read about in the media. So that's what the media publishes. Um, but we, like Wave, for example, you know, we found so much interest in our stablecoin farming um, products that, uh, you know, we, we launched a stablecoin farming focused fund called the Stable Asset Yield Fund. And that product has actually attracted uh, like hundreds of millions of dollars of interest from from specifically from institutions. And these are like old world, old school institutions, um, you know, like old European family offices and private banks and things like that. Um, so there is still a ton of interest from these guys, particularly uh, when it comes to stable coins. Um, we're actually launching that product later this month. So we're pretty excited about that one. That's very interesting that you bring that up. Uh, Brees, before you just jump in, I wanted to ask, how much do these institutions slash clients value the differentiation between centralized stable coins and decentralized stable coins? Or, or are they similar to most of crypto Twitter where it's just high yield equals to that's what matters? It'd be interesting to hear that. Yeah, so after UST, uh, that 
became a more salient point in the discussions because prior to that, uh, basically institutions looked at stable coins and just thought it was one, you know, one big asset class. If it's a stable coin, it's a stable coin, it's a stable coin. Um, the implosion of UST really sort of drove home for them the fact that there are uh, differentiations between uh, these different stable coins in terms of how stable they actually are and how the assets that are backing them are held. Now, these old school institutions that are looking to deploy, they still have a C5 first kind of a mindset. So the thought of somebody like Circle or Tether, which typically they consider not as, as good as Circle, but the idea of them having actual dollars in a bank account is usually pretty important to them. Um, they like to know that this, you know, esoteric asset, this this USDC, this USDT, whatever, can be exchanged for an actual dollar in an actual bank. Um, I think over time, actually, I'm, I'm pretty certain that over time that is going to fade. Uh because especially last year, the cascading failures across the centralized crypto space really drove home another important point, which is that CFI institutions, I mean, we've, we've, we've always known this, right? This is why crypto exists. But CFI institutions are infinitely fallible. Uh, and so trusting the safety of your assets on the promises of an individual uh, representing a corporation uh, is always it is always eventually going to lead you into trouble. Um, and whereas on the DeFi side, you know, obviously this was all sparked by UST blowing up and the, the DeFi ecosystem on Luna blowing up. But from there, everything else in DeFi basically contained that contagion. Uh, we did not see cascading failures throughout the DeFi space uh, because unlike in CeFi, if a DeFi protocol says that it's over collateralized, it typically is over collateralized. And you can go and see on chain that that is true. And if a DeFi protocol says that it's going to liquidate assets at a certain threshold, it's going to liquidate those assets at that threshold. There is no shady back office dealing. Oh, this is our biggest client. We don't want to piss them off. So we're not going to liquidate them. Oh, wow. Now, like, you know, now our position is at a 60% discount and we have to declare bankruptcy, right? Like that doesn't happen in DeFi. And so you don't see cascading failures through DeFi. Um, and so this is a point that Rhett and I have been just absolutely driving home for uh, to our investors and publicly as much as we can, which is that, OK, cool. You know, stable coins are the sort of the next, uh, you know, the next sort of big on entry point for uh, institutional investors. And they need to understand that while they may feel more comfortable because of their old world mindset with a centralized stable coin with centralized reserves, um, the reality is that decentralized stable coins with crypto asset reserves and, you know, provably, verifiably, uh, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? B basically, smart contracts that will do what they say they're going to do. That is the way that you want to, uh, it, that's the way that you want your assets to be secured and you want your position to be secured. Just to add on to that, a couple of thoughts here. Um, I think, you know, institutions um, probably care a little bit less about censorship resistance with, for the sake of censorship resistance than maybe a lot of us um, care about it more fundamentally. But what they do care a lot about is um, risk of loss. Um, and if you say, okay, like, you know, liquidity, for example, is immutable, um, censorship resistant, has this really like incredible track record with respect to not falling below peg and performing as um, expected. Um, it it's uh, so it's not the censorship resistance so much they care about, but how that impacts risk. And um, and so you know, LUSD is is kind of toward the top of that list as far as. Um, like low risk assets. And so it matters in that sense um, to institutions.
That's very interesting to hear, guys. I think also it's a good segue to the next question that I have is, obviously, you guys get a lot of interest in borrowing DeFi, borrowing staples against Ethereum, I guess, wrapped Bitcoin or whatever as well. But what would be keen to hear is, you know, how why the interest how do you promote the interest in liquidity to your clients like what's the value proposition that you that you guys choose to uh have them choose liquidity over say ave or maker dao or some of the other protocols out there yeah i mean we you know i had heard of liquidity uh prior to uh ret joining us but ret was the one who uh joined wave last year and just sang the praises of liquidity uh, nonstop. So, Rhett, I think I think you're probably better qualified to <laughs> to speak to that point. Um, sure. Yeah. So, uh, um, I'm a big, obviously, a big fan of Liquidity. I'm a big fan of some of the others you named as well. Um, basically, you know, the the genesis of some of this DeFi as a service stuff. Um, you know, the the first week I was at Wave, we had a call where a client um, was interested in basically having us send their ETH over to BlockFi so they could, you know, grab a BlockFi loan for some personal use. And my thought was, well, why don't we just do the same in DeFi? It's, I mean, at the time I didn't actually, I did not think that BlockFi was at at risk of insolvency. I just thought it's worse terms in every way. So why not uh, DeFi? And speaking to some of the others with that client specifically, I just spun up a quick little document to walk them through and said, look, um, you know, if instead of, instead of BlockFi, if we use DeFi, here are some options. Aave, okay, it's variable interest, but low interest. And this is what that would look like. MakerDAO looks like this. Liquidity looks like this. I think I um, looked at like, you know, maybe half a dozen options. And said, look, all of these are good options. All of them are better than BlockFi. Um, But for you, we think that liquidity is ideal because there's going to be a longer term borrow. um, And uh, and so the fee structure was was more attractive than the others. So it's kind of like all of these are great options. We think this one's, um, you know, extremely low risk. It's immutable. um, And the fee structure is really attractive. And so. Uh, you know, we, we ended up opening up a liquidity loan for that client. And then we've done the same for others as well. So um, I think, you know, to some extent, it depends on the needs of the person. So if I had, you know, someone come to me and say, Hey, um, I'm thinking about, I guess, you know, you can't do it in BlockFi anymore, but I'm thinking about this centralized lending thing, but I only want to borrow for a few weeks. Um, to do this thing, and then I'm going to pay back. Well, for those, maybe Ave is going to be the most attractive uh, venue, um, or you know, Euler, or or one of these uh, places compared with um, Liquidity that's particularly great for longer term borrowers. So that's kind of how some of that began. And I, I think you know, more generally, by the way, I think a lot of people um, who are entering the DeFi space think that DeFi is a is a yield venue like, Oh, you do DeFi. That means you generate yield. And I think that misses half of the value of DeFi, which is, it's also just a better place to get utility out of your crypto assets. Um, better in, in every way, you know, com- you compare to BlockFi, you say, okay, first of all, they lost all of their clients money potentially. We'll see how that kind of plays out. But even before that happened, the cost of loans was higher. The prices at which you would get liquidated were higher. And, um, and then you don't have the transparency. You don't have all these other benefits. Um, so that's, that's, uh, kind of how, how I view, um, liquidity specifically. And then, sorry, just a couple of other quick points compared to their peers, the immutability is is really attractive as well that's like a very major de-risking thing so it's like okay longer term borrowers it's the best cost structure but secondly the immutability given the length of time liquidity has been around really puts it like best in class with respect to risk as well yeah i wonder if the the fee structure that is I mean, again, I don't know much about regular finance, 
Uh, but even in DeFi, upfront initiation fees, uh, apart from liquidity, uh, I don't know of many slash any protocol doing it. And that was one of the things that I really liked when I first used it, is, you know, how overall it kind of neatly connects together where, hey, you have an unstoppable protocol that has a fee structure that is really optimized for long-term borrowing. But hey, by the way, that's cool because this doesn't have governance. So you can have a loan ongoing for years and you won't wake up to a nasty surprise because some random from the other end of the internet decided to triple the rate of uh, the loan you were paying. So, you know, do they do they connect the dots like this too? Um, I think... Uh... A lot of the job at a, at a crypto asset manager like this is education, um, where a lot of those same sorts of dots, I think, get connected more by those of us who are really deep into into this space. And then, you know, our, our job is to kind of go and educate others. So, like, I see um, those same benefits you do. And then that that kind of influences how I speak about these things like, hey, the you know this unstoppable nature like okay it's ungoverned it's immutable it has these really excellent um mechanisms you know the stability pool for liquidation is is a really great mechanism for example um you know i see all those same benefits too and then the the translation to these you know uh crypto whales or institutions etc is more hey this is like from a risk perspective very low on the risk spectrum for these reasons and then you know the the terms of the loans are extremely good if you're borrowing for especially the longer you borrow the better the terms are relative to peers so that's kind of i think how that translates yeah and <clears throat> i'm sorry i had some uh headphone issues so i might have missed this but you know for a lot of our clients um you know, they are also looking for ways to leverage their crypto assets to buy real world assets, houses, cars, uh, et cetera. And so something like liquidity, uh, where they can basically borrow for almost no or, you know, a de minimis cost and then use that to purchase. You know, we had one client who bought her house with it. Um, I will probably buy a car this year, um, you know, taking out a loan against uh, my ETH or my LSDs. Um because why not? I mean, why would I pay, you know, 6% a year or more? I guess it's probably more now with, uh, with rates, with rate rises. Um, when I could, you know, I could basically pay zero financing costs, half a point in financing costs uh, to purchase an asset. Exactly. And I think that that point about educating, I think, is quite quite valuable because I think even in working with crypto protocols itself as well, we see that, that the decentralized aspect of LUSD and promoting that is also something that we have to do ourselves here. Uh, one question I had, and I guess this is kind of relating to more on the LUSD side of things and on the liquidity strategy side of things as well. Uh, obviously, you have clients who borrow against their ETH, uh, Borrow LUSD, let's say, but I, I believe you also mentioned earlier about this uh, yield farming uh, and using LUSD in, in different uh, protocols or farms and even on arbitrage charges and the likes. It'd be great to hear some insights from you guys to you know how you're actually using the LUSD, be it on, and obviously you don't have to go very in the weeds, but are you using it? doing it like a very concentrated liquidity pool on Uniswap? Are you using it on Curve? Are you using the likes of Euler uh, to short and long the LUSD peg? It'd be kind of interesting to hear like how a fund manager like yourself would would use LUSD in different liquidity strategies. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, LUSD, we basically started with... Um, uh, you know, just dropping it into the stability pool. Um, <clears throat> and then as we broadened our, it, it, we have, so we have like a very kind of careful risk management process where, you know, if we're using an asset, uh, we, first of all, it can't be brand new. It needs to have a certain amount of TVL behind it. Um, and when we do start using it, we don't, you know, suddenly just plow uh, a significant portion of our funds into it. Um, 
So the first thing that we wanted to understand, of course, was the volatility of LUSD itself. Um, we had noticed when we were taking LUSD uh, loans out for our clients <clears throat> that um, uh, it tended to be above peg, uh, which was great when, we're, when you're taking out a loan because it, it more than pays for the upfront fee. Um, but it is a risk on the back end if you, when you want to pay that loan back if, uh, if the peg deviates significantly above a dollar. Um, and so that was something that we wanted to keep an eye on and understand how much volatility there was in that peg. Um, as uh, we got more and more comfortable with that, it does tend to stay above a dollar, but it, it tends to trade in a very small range above a dollar. So it's still stable. It's just not necessarily dollar, you know, a one dollar stable coin. Um, uh, so as we got more comfortable with that, um, uh, you know, we started to broaden uh, our exposure to it across, uh, you know, uh, uh, Uniswap farming uh, uh, and and um, uh, other liquidity provision. Um, Rhett's really sort of at the forefront, I think, of, uh, you know, dreaming up new ways for us to use LSD, uh, LUSD. Um, obviously, the fact that it is a fully crypto-backed over-collateralized stablecoin, we like that a lot from uh, from our perspective, but we do also always have uh, that sort of educational hurdle that we have to push back against a little bit with our clients, where they, where, you know, they come back and they say, "Well, what is this asset? Why is this in my portfolio?" Um, you know, I'd like to be more exposed to USDC than, uh, you know, Frax or some other algorithmic stablecoin. How does LUSD fit on that spectrum? Um, and so it's like sort of like a continual battle for us to. Uh, to get them more and more comfortable with the crypto collateralized versus dollar collateralized coins. Um, but in terms of the actual strategies, I mean, Rhett, I think you're, you're probably one of the best people to speak to that. Yeah, sure. I can jump in. Um, and sorry, my, my um, headphones were not working at the very beginning of this. So I don't know if this context was given. I'm just going to like add a little asterisk here. So I'm actually an, al an alum to wave now. I still do, um, you know, some advisory, like kind of consulting stuff, but I'm going to, uh, as far as like specifics of wave strategies, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to talk about ways that I think LUSD is great to use. And then I'll leave it to Henry to decide how much of that um, he wants to disclose. Um, so, so yeah, still, still have a close relationship with wave, but I'm um, focusing my time actually on a, on a friendly liquidity fork, as some of you know, but that's, that's a discussion for another time. So um, uh so a couple of things about LUSD, the, the tendency to go over peg, I kind of think of that as a implicit cost to the borrower, um, but implicit yield to the um, holder slash farmer of LUSD. And I also think that um, what's, what's particularly attractive, so when markets are really volatile, uh, especially when they're crashing, volatile to, to the downside, um, Assets like LUSD, assuming they don't end up with a bunch of bad debts, um, tend to go over peg, not under. So they're very attractive assets to be in if you uh, feel like there's some risk of, you know, say an FTX blow up. And we saw that with FTX. When FTX blew up, LUSD went to like, what, $1.07 or something. Um, and if you're smart about it, there are great ways to take advantage of the fact that it's going over peg. So I'm going to speak about a few of those. Um, I think uh, Uniswap V3 is an underappreciated venue uh, for an asset like LUSD, where if you say, hey, I'm going to concentrate my liquidity uh, in a position where I'm getting pretty high yield on transaction fees, but it's also a price at which I would be comfortable kind of like exiting LUSD and waiting for it to fall back down, uh, then you can kind of get both advantages, you know, while you're sitting in that pool you're earning good yield. And then if LUSD pumps, um, going out of bounds is not the, not the worst thing in the world. Um, I think, so I think that's a really underappreciated venue. Um, I think that Euler is also a really great venue uh, and, and places like it, especially once it gets to high levels. Um, so, um, and, and what I personally tend to avoid and tend to like, um, you know, I don't like propose a lot of this to 
you know, to, to wave uh, when implementing strategies either is like the really, the really degen plays where you, you know, you can do some things on Euler um, that, uh, you know, if you're smart about it and, and, and careful, you can make a lot of money, but like, you know, can add some risk. Um, it's more like, okay, so, so things like, um, you know, going really heavy on the short side or something like that is not something that I tend to play in as much. Um, but it can be great for those like, okay, it's hit a dollar eight. It tends to be lower than that. It's not going over a dollar 10. Um, okay. Then shorting it might make a lot of sense. Um, but that's not, that's kind of, I think a reasonable area to play, but it's not a, not an area that I, uh, tend to engage quite in as much. It's more like, okay, where can I provide liquidity, uh, generate yield. And if it just so happens to pump during a market meltdown, uh, you kind of can take advantage of that and, and, and exit, um, uh, intelligently and then wait for things to fall back down. Thanks for that, guys. I think, Brees, you also released an article recently, right, which kind of talked about the different strategies of using LUST and, I mean, Euler and Uniswap R2. But there are a few more. Would you like to just give a quick touch into that? And then I guess we could also share the article here if people have not miss, have missed it. Yeah, I guess if, if our chats inspired some in the audience and they would like to try their, their chance out with some strategies... So I produce this content uh, just to essentially walk people through the various integrations that have been gathered for LUSD this year. Um, it's been added one way or another to more than a dozen of different DeFi protocols, so it can get a bit dense to navigate. And, and this article walks you through the places where you can use LUSD as collateral or you can borrow it or even more advanced use case like what you have on Gearbox where um, liquidity provider of the LUSD Swiss ERV pool on Curve can leverage the position under collateralized up to uh, 10 times. I like that Gearbox strategy, by the way, especially if, if there's enough activity in, in those. Um, like I said, I don't tend to... I, I generally don't tend to engage in high amounts of leverage uh, or kind of even suggest it to others, but um, the, the risk level of those leverage strategies is quite a bit lower if you are in stables that you trust and LUSD is one of those really high quality. And then I think chicken bonds has also been, by the way, an interesting one where um, I, I'm a fan of chicken bonds. The yield on it, if you've kind of tracked it for those here, um, went you know very high and then it's kind of gone quite low, um, which is one of the risks of a system like that. But the principal protected nature of it and the fact your principal is LUSD makes it one of those things where, okay, if the yields are attractive and you enter it, you know that if that changes, you have uh, an escape hatch into something that's uh, a really high quality asset. So that's one that I think um, is, is a good one to just watch as well. And um, I'm interested to see that may become more attractive over time too, if chicken bonds get other integrations into DeFi, where you could say, okay, I can either hold BLUSD or yep. chicken bonds, and then I can borrow against them and earn yield while I wait for them to mature, et cetera. So yeah, it's coming. Um, I've got to admit, we, we had some assumptions that were a bit challenged by reality on this round. So for instance, we thought the egg NFT of chicken bonds would be a super easy sell to offer as collateral for NFT lending platforms. Because, you know, hey, here's an NFT, you can trigger a function, and boom, you get sound solid LUSD. So, you know, liquidating that is super easy. But there is a lot of education to be made because most of those uh, NFT leveraging platform, they're more built under the assumption, I want to say of, hey, I'm Bob, I own an ape that is worth 50 ETH and I'm going to leverage 10 ETH out of it. You know, something like that. So they're not used to borrow stable with, um, with NFTs. But on the DeFi side, uh, it's making straight. So, uh, yeah, the flow we're discussing for Gearbox, we're trying to have it replicated for the BLUSD LP, which would be quite interesting. And then there are other places looking at adding 
a bit USD as collateral too. Um, and I think, yeah, there are a few lives already, but they're not the best lending venues. And I would definitely not recommend them to institutional investors, if you know the one I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah, I'm familiar. Yeah, I think there's... Um, I think there's a, a, a lot of great like ways to support it. And I, I, I think you're right that one, you, you probably have inside information, but I think you're right that it will be widely, those things will be widely supported over time. And that makes, makes them even more attractive where you say, Hey, if I can, if I can hold BLUSD, which has a rising floor, and then I can also borrow against it and earn yield, et cetera, then that like strengthens the uh, case for using it. So We'll be excited to see kind of what what things emerge there. Cool, thanks for that. Uh, just uh, guys who are an audience for the audience, we have just posted uh, beneath this uh, this spaces tweet a comment with the article uh, that I mentioned earlier about using LUSD across DeFi. So highly recommend reading that. Uh, one other thing I wanted to quickly mention, you know, is also LUSD now is available on on different layer twos as well. We're growing quite a lot in optimism. We have quite a bit decent liquidity on Arbitrum as well. And tomorrow we're also doing another spaces, a quick plug with Sun Finance, which is a money market on optimism. It also is LUSD's first foray into the money market side of things on a layer two. So keep an eye out for that. I think, you know, before we just open it up to questions, one last thing I wanted to, to check with you guys, Rhett and Henry, is, you know, what would you like to see more of in for LUSD and in DeFi in general in, in the next year or so? If there's anything specific, I know I'm putting you on the spot, but, you know, if there's one thing you'd like to see before we open up to questions, that'd be great. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I mean, on the LUSD side, I would love to see, uh, you know, the peg trend more towards par. Um, but otherwise, you know, I, I think the uh, the launch of chicken bonds was great. Um, I love the you know immutable nature of the underlying protocol itself, um, which gives us a lot of confidence uh, in using it. Um, across DeFi, you know, it's funny because like a lot of the a lot of the things that drove me nuts in 2021 and 2022, um, you know, have been. Uh, uh, absolved in a large way, just as a result of the bear, you know, a lot of the weaker projects, projects that had poor design projects that were just cash grabs. Um, you know, I, I, I would just love to see, you know, people to continue to focus on the fundamentals and like building, uh, true primitives, uh, that push the, the, the place forward, uh, the, the, the space forward. Um, you know, the, the power of DeFi is basically the composability, um, and the fact that that allows for this basically completely unstoppable surge of innovation um, and this constant, constant iteration and improvement. Uh, and, you know, when everybody's sort of focused on number go up, uh, you know, where can I get my next 10,000% yield? Uh, it, it takes away from that, right? It, it creates a little bit of a brain drain uh, as people are just chasing uh, the next highest yield. Um, it's not a problem right now. Uh, so, you know, it's it's not something that I think DeFi needs to solve right now. I just hope that the next time we have, uh, you know, once we get back into the bull, because we all know the bull's coming back, um, I just hope that that, you know, that there, there continues to be a, a strong focus on the fundamentals. And there are, you know, tons of, and I, and I know that there are, but, you know, I, I just, uh, <laughs> I don't know. I've been through a couple of bear cycles and I just, I love the bear. I love the bear because it's just builders and it's people you know, building focused projects and they're, they're just not focused on the, they're not distracted by all the, the BS of the bandwagon uh, when everybody jumps on during the bull. So I guess I'm reminiscing for uh, our, our bittersweet future exit from the, from the bear market. But I think right now DeFi is great. I guess what we could do a little bit better is organize uh, our lobbying efforts. I guess shifting from tech uh, and shifting from, you know, building one of the biggest threats to DeFi in the future, you know, it, despite the fact that it, you can't kill DeFi, uh, regulators and legislators can still make it very difficult to use DeFi. Uh, and the best way to fight against that is for 
DeFi to figure out some way to have representation, um, to have a DeFi focused lobbying group of some sort. I know it sounds dirty and it kind of makes my skin crawl a little bit just saying it, but unfortunately that is the way of the world. Um, and I think one of the best things that we can do to ensure that DeFi continues on its inexorable march towards dominance uh, is to uh, try to protect ourselves, to try to hedge against future hurdles. Uh, and regulators and legislators will throw up hurdles uh, uh, if we're not there to try to stop them. Um, and, you know, even though, you know, I'm a CeFi guy who really likes DeFi and, you know, I try to align myself with the values, um, the reality is that, you know, from a financial perspective, most CeFi crypto companies are not really incentivized to allow widespread access to DeFi. They're incentivized to gatekeep access to DeFi um, and build, you know, the, the famous DeFi mullet where, you know, they have control over the clients and they have control over that gateway. Um, and, and, you know, they will lobby regulators to force uh, investors to access DeFi through them. Um, and I just don't think that that is necessarily the ideal way for DeFi to act, you know, for, for DeFi to, to, to work in the future. So, yeah, if I could say one thing, I, I would say, you know, for DeFi protocols, you know, DeFi participants to band together and figure out some uh, concerted effort uh, to uh, make sure that their voices are heard uh, in the halls of, you know, legislature. A couple of thoughts on my side. Um, so some, some to uh, DeFi specific or crypto specifically and some to, to liquidity. I expect um, as, as kind of the layer twos are, are uh, maturing there to be a, a lot more of what we're seeing, which is kind of the, the growth of derivatives platforms. I think that's a really good thing for the space. Um, I, I expect to see more of that and I hope to see more of that. And I think there will be a lot of innovation there, which is great. Um, one thing that I think about LUSD and, and some others, but probably I think LUSD is, is best in class here is it's, I view it as almost a public good to have a, a stable coin that's as censorship resistant as LUSD is. So I would love to see more platforms um, integrating with these more censorship resistant um, stables. So like an example is um, GMX right now, uh, it, it has a basket of stables um, as part of GLP. Front the news. Say again. <laughs> no, it's just again. No, we're actually discussing with uh, similar protocols on Arbitrum now that we have LUSD there. Oh. And you're right, there is keen interest on their end to add uh, LUSD as, as colla not collateral necessarily, but essentially the base assets of the protocol. Yeah, exactly. So, so that's like a good example of like, um, I think GMX is great. I think, you know, GLP um, can be an interesting play for people. I think having censorship resistant stables in the basket of, of the GLP assets would be really cool or same thing for, for competitors. And I think um, just in general, I think the space is is going to be healthier if um, a lot of protocols like at least try to integrate with the more censorship resistant um, assets. I think there's just a lot of benefits to that. So that's something that I would love to see more. Um, I think there's probably some level of of um, you know to Henry's point, like is LUSD kind of um, tracks closer to PEG, then it probably makes it easier to integrate into certain protocols that kind of uh, want to have some of those assumptions and then they can kind of, um, you know, that can become a virtuous cycle. So, um, so yeah, that's, that's, that's kind of more of what I would like to see is, is more, you know, layer two and derivatives platforms finding ways to, to integrate with assets like this. Well, it's neat news. So if I recap your ask, or well, a big one is uh, essentially tightening the range of LUSD surrounding PEG. And it's been doing pretty good uh, on this front lately. Uh, but yeah, part of it is also the market situation and not just uh, the liquidity structure. And I guess the second one is more about um, densifying the ecosystem of use cases, uh, most notably on L2. And so, yeah, 
I guess long way to tell you that both are being worked on and I hope to have a um, credible milestone to deliver on the matter this year. We also finally have an optimism oracle, chain link oracle. So I think that will help on the integration side of things as well, with Son being one uh, tomorrow. Cool. So I guess what would be good now is, I guess, in the present of time, we should probably just limit the questions to two or so. But if any of the audience members have any questions that they would like to ask Gret or Henry, please just raise your hand and I'll bring you up to the stage. I guess our audience are a bit quiet today. So in that case, we'll probably just wrap it up. Uh, Thank you guys again, Henry and Rhett, for joining the spaces today. I mean, it was very informative and very, very good to learn about, you know, how institutions are approaching DeFi. Uh, just a reminder to everyone on the on the spaces as well, we're hosting another one tomorrow with Son Finance, a money market on Layer 2. But yeah, thanks everyone for joining. This will be also recorded and uploaded to YouTube. But thank you so much. Thanks, guys. This was great. Really appreciate it. Thanks for joining Red and Henry. See you next time.